I think we're about ready to start. Thank you for being patient with us. Um, so welcome to the many pupils from Highgate and partner schools um, who are thinking about a career in medicine together with OC, some of whom are currently training or involved in medicine already. Clearly in the past year, um, we've all struggled. It's been very stressful and it's definitely placed incredible demands on so many medical professionals. Uh, and understandably, it's been difficult for prospective students to access support or work experience. And there's a lot of uncertainty um, that has affected us all. Um, but we are delighted that Simon, Ali and Ben are joining us this evening to provide some insight into the medical profession before we take your questions at the end. So just to remind everyone, you can post your questions in the chat box. And if, and if we get time, we will get uh, we will have a hopefully some time at the end to ask them. Uh, but to begin with, uh, I will start with Simon. Hi, Simon. Good evening. Uh, cool. So You're joining us today. Uh, I know it's a, a, not the best of times for you. Uh, it's busy and stressful, uh, but I'm sure everyone here uh, is very grateful uh, for your time. Uh, so thank you, uh, first and foremost. Uh, but we would love to hear about your journey to the amazing point you've got. I'm sure everyone here knows of you, has followed your journey and your incredible work. Um, but we'd love to know, you know, what brought you to where you are today? Um, that's really kind. I, I hate being introduced. It's a bit like writing like a dating profile. It's like Simon <laughs> Leo and likes long walks on the beach. It's all sort of fake news, really. Uh, I, I suppose that the first thing to say is, is um, this isn't, I hope the next 10 minutes or so isn't going to be what you get in a, a lot of careers talks, and a lot of medical talks, which um, is a fig jam talk. Now, because I, I always get told off for swearing when I speak to students, uh, for the purposes of this talk, fig jam st stands for uh, fudge, I'm good, just ask me. And that's generally where people kind of stand there for five, 10 minutes and just talk about what a rock star they are and how all they do is win and how successful they've been. And I, when I was at school, I never found those talks helpful. If anything, they felt uh, unobtainable and smacked of privilege and luck. <laughs> You know, well, I was able to not, you know, travel the world for five years and then I just stumbled on this great thing. And it's like, well, because you could afford to travel the world for five years and you stumbled because they were a friend of a friend of a whatever. So. So, yeah. So my name's Simon. I'm I'm an orthopedic trainee currently taking time out of my orthopedic training to to um, to do a Ph.D. in in education, in medical education. I I left Highgate uh, 2001. And, and when I, I tell these stories, I always start with the fact that my story is primarily a story of, of failure. Um, I have failed far more times than I've succeeded. It's just that I try and learn every time I screw up. So I remember walking into uh, senior school and on A-level results day and like, I had four London offers because I talk the talk and got load like I interview really well right and um and I got an A and two C's and I remember even the school were like what did you do <laughs> like what, what did you do Simon like this was a gift and I remember going home and I walked in to find like my mum taking the banner down and hiding the cake and all that sort of stuff it's like proper like heartbreak this would be like the really sad bit at the beginning of that x factor audition where they play the touching music um and so i asked the school for advice and they gave me great advice around resits and gap years and all that sort of stuff and i called around all the universities and and most of them were like it's results day why are you calling us we're busy mm -hmm. um and i didn't know what to do so i planned i planned to reset my a levels uh, I booked into a college and I was going to reset my A-levels. And then I found um, a BMED psych course in Newcastle that uh, had a thing whereby if you, if you came in the top something per year, you were offered sidestepping into medicine. So I was like, screw resets. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Newcastle. It's a great town. It's got a great course for medicine and, and for sciences. I'll do that. 
And so I applied for that. I booked my accommodation in Newcastle. I was going to go, I was going to be a biomedical scientist in Newcastle. And, um, and a, a friend of a friend who is a doctor reached out to me and said, I, I heard <laughs> like everyone in the family heard. Um, and, and he was like, look, if you want to be a doctor, stop with all the interview. I, you know, I like science and I want to help people rubbish. Decide why you really want to be a doctor. Decide why it is they should make you a doctor rather than the hundreds of other people. He was like, get cut through all the, you know, the rubbish you get from the courses in your careers tutors. Decide for yourself, then write it down on paper and tell them. So I had this really weird day where my mum drove me around all the places I'd interviewed and I hand delivered these, these letters saying, my name is Simon Fleming. I screwed up my A-levels. This is why. You should make me a doctor. And this is why. Uh, and I kept doing it like every, every like seven to 10 days, I would go to these medical schools and these admission tutors were like, go away. <laughs> um, and I kept doing it and kept doing it. And eventually three of the four places I'd applied basically got back to me and said, cease and desist, stop pestering us, reset your A-levels and we'll take you. And Bart's in the London where I, where I trained as a medical student were silent. So I, I was like, you know what, I'll just go to Newcastle. I'll do the biomedical science thing. Like I still don't want to have to do my A-levels again, but it was always my plan B or C. And then I remember it vividly. I was at a house party and my phone rings and it's this lovely lady says, oh, hello, it's the admissions department at Barts in the London. We were wondering if you would like to uh, start medicine in about uh, five weeks time. And I thought it was a friend of mine at the party winding me up. So I swore and hung up oh dear <laughs> and um and then my phone rang again and it was this lady and she was like I'm really sorry I there was a lot of background noise I I, I didn't hear your answer do you want to start medicine and I was like yeah yeah I yeah I really do and and that was it and suddenly I was in medical school and and I did my five years at Barts in the London and then um there was a change in the way they um they allocated your first year medical jobs. It was called MMC. It was a big government directive that was a, a huge cock up. And I was the first year of that. And so I didn't get a medical job. I, it was unheard of myself and about a thousand other people found out after we'd graduated that I, we hadn't gotten do jobs as doctors, which again is like unheard of, right? But it was, it was me and about a thousand other people. And so I had to go through again, this humbling experience of, of self-reflection yeah um and of self-assessment and of self-criticism and you know interestingly uh, when you become a doctor if you want to be a, a surgeon for example you have to sit the membership exams of, of one of these colleges so that you can be labeled a surgeon and I'd had such an awful experience of my A-levels I'd worked really hard during medical school and I did pretty well during medical school and um and then I sat these surgical exams and again it was the the first time I'd, I'd failed a postgraduate exam, I'd had like 10 years of, again, being a high achiever and all the rest. And then I failed this exam. And I remember calling up the Royal College of Surgeons and saying, hi, my name's Simon. I, I failed by one mark. I, I'm wondering if I could have a remark because it's just one mark. And I, I wonder if you've made a mistake. And I remember it vividly. This male voice just goes, we are the Royal College of Surgeons and we do not make mistakes. And then the line went dead. And I was like, what? And, and, and throughout my career, there are stories like that of, of knowing what I want and going for it and not always being fully successful, of making mistakes, of falling down, of not only not being perfect, but being far from perfect. But the difference is I used to be, uh, younger Simon was very much like, you know, I either win or I lose. And increasingly, as my career has progressed and I've done all the things I've done and the opportunities I've had, I realized that I win or I learn. Mm -hmm. And actually the more I've failed, the better I've got mm -hmm. at everything, at being a human being, at being a doctor, at being a surgeon. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the work I do now is around culture change. And I do loads of work around equality and diversity and bullying in healthcare, because there are some problems in healthcare. Like it is not, 
it is not the dream that everyone thinks it is when you start work and it's you know healthcare is not the streets are not paved with gold um and interestingly my entire journey through healthcare goes back to those letters i wrote which is i don't really want to help people that's not how i'm wired right i'm not a, i'm not a gp i'm not that person i like fixing things I like seeing things that are broken and making them better. And, and whether it's patients or uh, problems in theory or culture or the NHS, um, my career in medicine has allowed me to fix things and make them, make them better. And I think that's the best thing about medicine for me, a career in medicine is not only does it actually allow you to make mistakes and get better from them, but there is a place for everyone. Where my passion lies isn't gonna be where your passion lies, right? I have no interest in dermatology, rheumatology, GP, whatever, but that's okay because I found what I'm good at and have been supported to try and do those things. And for people going into a career in medicine, I, I would just advise them that, that the the range of opportunities is there. And the best thing you can do is try and have, have this psychological thing about grit. So know what you want, know what you care about, know what matters to you. Ignore all the people and voices that tell you you're too young, you're too female, you're too brown, you're too anything. Like reach out to people, be supported. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. And then you will find yourself 10 or 20 years down the line giving really cringe careers talks where you get to go, yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis, I kind of get to do what I love. And that's me. Absolutely. Thank you, Simon. That, that's very, very insightful. Um, it's, it's really good to hear that medicine and your, you know, your path into medicine is rarely ever as uh, straightforward and as shiny as most people think it is. Um, and you know, and it's it's good to hear if someone succeeded so well in what they do, um, that you know, actually the path is filled with loopholes and all sorts of things. And actually, medicine doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean helping people all the time in the way you think you're helping. You know, you don't have to be clinically helping people to be involved in medicine. And maybe that's something that a lot of our listeners can take into account uh, or bear in mind when choosing medicine. Uh, and the aspects, just um, uh, for our 10 minutes, I just wanted to know how, what you think, I mean, with the influence of AI in, in medicine, it's changing so much, different, you know, different ways of being involved in medicine and, and patient treatment. And also with COVID over the past year, everything is so rapidly changing. What do you think the impact of COVID combined with AI um, is going to have on medical practice on the long term? And what are the challenges that um, medical professionals and the NHS will be facing in the future? I ask a great question and I, I kind of want to split them up. So I think I think COVID has changed everything. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I hate that that phrase, the new normal. And I've been lucky or or privileged or unlucky enough to be involved in a lot of COVID stuff this year um, as a national trainee representative. Uh, working at kind of a an, an, uh, strategic level, if you like, um, and and quite a bit of work at the at the Nightingales as well, as well as kind of frontline stuff in my local hospitals. COVID has changed the way we do everything, and I think the risk we have is when things calm down again, going back to the old ways of doing things. And it's 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 difficult to remind ourselves that before COVID, things weren't perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, before COVID, I was giving talks about how to improve education, how to improve training, how to shorten waiting lists, how to improve equality and, and diversity. You know, none of those things have been made better by COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly for medical training at an undergraduate level, it, like everything's gone to pieces. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things that have been made better. Um, what we're doing now, Zoom, you know, any other time, before COVID, we'd have done this in person. I'd have had to not been home and come to Highgate and missed an evening with my family. And not everyone would have been able to make it for whatever reason. 
Um, so it, there are going to be, again, there's going to be loads of learning to be done. Um, and I think that's the best thing it's going to do is it's going to force us into a growth mindset and to look at what's happened and go, right, what, what have we built that's good and we should keep? And what have we built that is, was necessary and we should bin? And what have we built that actually is far, far worse? And we should definitely bin. AI is an interesting one. AI is only as good as the data you put in. So there's some fascinating papers about racist AI, for example. Um, one of the massive studies they did for artificial intelligence was around recognizing skin cancers. And because of the study, the hospital it was done in, most of the people who they used for the AI were white. And so when the AI saw people with non-Caucasian skin, it didn't believe they existed. It literally didn't see people of color as existing. It's not the AI's fault. It had just never met a person who wasn't white. Um, on the other hand, uh, if it's done well, and we've seen some of that work around things like radiology, looking at x-rays and scans, it, it can massively change the way we work because it can look at stuff at a superhuman level. The trick again is um, not to fall into old habits. So for example, if you are a uh, radiologist and you look at loads of x-rays and suddenly you have a machine that looks at loads of x-rays for you, it's gonna give you more time. Mm -hmm. And the smart thing, the big question is, well, what do you do with that time? Do you use it smart and go, right, now that I have this new time, I can do these other things because the machine is doing that. Or does it just get eaten up by the system and someone goes, well, good. You can also be looking at x-rays while the machine is looking at x-rays and you can do a million and three things rather than a million. So AI is, is at the moment another tool. It may be the panacea. It may be the answer. It's not, it's not there yet but it is undeniably gonna play a role in the future of healthcare at every level. Because just like telemedicine and videos and laparoscopic surgery and antibiotics, in the early days, it's all just very exciting and very cool. And then you work out what it can do, what it can't do, and what it should do and what it shouldn't do. And I think we're not, we're not there yet. We're still at the kind of evangelist, isn't this thing wonderful yeah. stage. We gotta let the dust settle first. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Simon. This has been very helpful advice. Uh, I'm sure everyone's very grateful uh, for everything you've shared with us. Um, so I'm going to just quickly turn to Ali and Ben, who have joined us. They're two OCs who are currently undertaking medical degrees. Um, hello, both. Um, so Ben, let's let let's let's talk to you first. Um, can you give us a very brief insight into your studies and journey so far, going from A levels to your first uh, year of undergrad as a medical student? Uh, yeah. Um, so I left uh, Highgate in 2015, um, and I then went to Imperial College um, in Southwest London. Um, and in my fourth year, I took a break from my studies and I integrated in neuroscience and computational medicine. Uh, and in 60 days, not that I'm counting them down, I'll do my last final exam and then go off into the, the working world of, of medicine. Oh, fantastic. That's, that's really amazing. Uh, well done. Um, <laughs> you want to tell us, uh, do you want to, no, I mean it when I say well done. I, <laughs> I, I, I know what it's like and I know what those final, final exams are like. But um, so do you want to tell us a bit about um, the work involved each year? and um, the division between the practical elements um, of sure. your study and the more theoretical ones. Yeah, so I think it's, it's reasonably similar now across um, all of the medical schools in the country that the idea is you spend the early part of your degree kind of learning the basic sciences and it feels very much like you're doing the same thing as the biochemistry students. And so you're learning in the same way that you did when you were doing A-levels, how cells work, the different aspects of, of the base functions of diseases, how drugs interact in the body. Um, and so you kind of get a, a, a loose understanding of how you know, the basics of humans work. And then as you move through, through the five or six years that it takes you to do your degree, um, kind of moving into more um, practical real life, actually what do patients look like when they have these problems that we kind of learned about in theory in the first in the first two years. Um, and then a lot of schools now, I think increasingly, um, they're uh, encouraging students to take that, that year out to go and do um, another degree to kind of 
sort of take your mind off medicine. Um, and so people will go and do business degrees in that year out or do um, clinical degrees. And I think that's, that's really important. And then you come back to medicine, obviously, for your last two years. Uh, and then your last two years, I think at most medical schools in the country, almost completely in hospital, which um, really it feels like you probably should spend more years learning how to do the actual hospital bit of being a doctor. Um, you kind of, I think now that I'm getting so close to the end, um, you have moments where you're like, gosh, have I spent enough time actually in a hospital to, to know what the actual job is? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. Thank you. And Ali, um, you know, why don't you tell us a bit about your journey and maybe more particularly about when you realized what aspect of medicine you wanted to focus upon? I know this is something that a lot of people are so unsure about at the beginning um, and it might cause some anxiety and doubt. Um, so, what, you know, what's your take on that? And, and when was it for you that if, even, you know, do you know now or, or when was it that you realized what it is you want to do? Yeah, well, first of all, just to say, so nice to be not back physically at my old stomping grounds, but virtually talking to you all. So my journey into medicine, similar to Simon, it actually started off with a failure. So I didn't get in first time round. I majorly messed up my AS levels um, and I ended up getting ABCC. I was very arrogant from my GCSEs and didn't put enough work into my ASs. So word of advice, don't do that. And it's a huge jump up. So just make sure you put the right amount of work in because I was hugely disappointed. And so my teachers, um, they knew how passionate I was about studying medicine, but did kind of advised me that I should probably look at other options but I knew that I had it in me but I just didn't put enough work into it and so um, my year 13 was a bit of a hellish year I had to redo so many different exams um, but I reapplied and um, then I took a gap year and um it was really worth it, the gap year. I think it really made me grow as a person. And it sounds extremely cliche to say that, but it truly did. And I saw it in the practical sense when I started, um, I'm at Bristol, by the way, I'm at Bristol Medical School. And when I started in first year, I felt much more at ease um, living an independent life and being away from home and all the kind of social psychological um issues of being away because I obviously went away from London for uni and so the gap year even though it wasn't planned and all my best friends um who I had such a close-knit group at Highgate they were all going to uni and I started off in September when they were all going and I had no clue what was going to happen was I going to get into medicine this time around um etc etc and it ended up being fantastic. I got some incredible volunteering experiences. I remember I, it was a very odd um, work experience, but I volunteered for an HIV charity, handing out condoms in gay bars in Soho, which was very good in the preventative healthcare sense. Um, and then I got to travel, I earned some money and um, I found out when I was in Australia that I got into Bristol. So it all worked out. And so I advise everyone, if you know in your heart of hearts, you want to do medicine, don't just give up and go do biomed if you think you have it in you to try again. If you are happy to do, to do biomed and reapply for postgraduate or just let go of the um, career prospect, then that's fine too. Um, but it was very well worth it. So um, then in, in answer to your second question, when did I know what I wanted to do? Um, I'm a pretty stubborn person, so I've kind of held on to what I wanted to do since before I started at medical school. So I knew at Highgate already um, that I was really passionate about mental health and psychiatry. So um, a teacher of mine, a biology teacher of mine, who Dr. Stubbs knows well, he's no longer at Highgate, but he was one of the best, an Irish guy called um, Dr. Johnson. He had previously worked at King's Mental Health Institution doing research with uh, Professor Sir Simon Wesley. And he, um, at the time, Sir Simon Wesley was the chair of Royal College of Psychiatry. 
and I said to Dr. Johnson, Patrick, um, I said to him that I really had an interest and I was considering maybe doing an EPQ on something. I didn't end up doing an EPQ, by the way. Uh, it was too much work. Um, but yeah, I, I had an interest in psychiatry and I knew I wanted to just delve a bit deeper. So for Highgate's Science Magazine, um, very, very cool, I know, I wrote an article um, around what psychiatry entails. So Dr. Johnson put me in touch with this very prestigious top of his game psychiatrist. And I wrote an article, I went to his office, he was very kind to me and I interviewed him around the world of psychiatry. He did some brilliant research around um, military psychiatry and shell shock and PTSD in soldiers. And it was just very eye-opening. And so that article was actually actually printed and it's just to show how everything happens for a reason I have carried on I know I want to do psychiatry now so I've carried on since I've been at medical school going to different events and conferences in um, the realm of psychiatry and I went to a conference um, two years ago at Royal Society of Medicine in London and it was to do with I think the mental health and well-being of doctors and kind of looking after um, our workforce and he's now the chair and director of Royal Society of Medicine so he's a really big dog and I had no idea at the time when I interviewed him how big he was and I really didn't know um, you know I didn't really know anything about psychiatry so looking back at the questions I asked him and what I know now I just feel like I sound so um, young and just ignorant, but that's what happens, you grow. And anyways, so I knew he was gonna be the keynote speaker at this conference. And I went up to him and I had photocopied a copy of the article I wrote about him for the science magazine. And it was really lovely. He remembered me and um, it was super educational to just chat to him again. And yeah, so I knew I wanted to do that for a really long time. It was reaffirmed when I did my psychiatry placement in fourth year. That's when you do it at Bristol. So um, for you guys, the way kind of medical school curricula works, you um, it works differently at every medical school, but you do the different specialties. So all the different systems of medicine, you do placements in them at different hospitals. And so when I did my psychiatry one, I just knew, yeah, um, I'm going to stay with my stubbornness and yeah, stick with my guns. So hopefully, yeah, psychiatry okay. will happen for me. Well, that's great. It's, it's, it's great to hear, you know, uh, that some people do know what they want to do right from the beginning, uh, maybe before they even do their A-levels. Um, but uh, I know many don't. And uh, many medical doctors uh, who are my friends at the Highgate had absolutely no idea what they wanted to focus on in medicine. Um, like Simon told you his story. And, um, you know, I think like Ali just mentioned, uh, actually going in, learning more about yourself, about medicine as a whole, and doing your placement will really help put things in focus. And it won't be too late to decide later down your journey, you know, to decide what you want to do. And it's, it's, it's okay. It's not something that you have to know or be clear about now. But, um, you know, I really want to know, Ben, what did you enjoy most about your studies and what was the biggest challenge that you faced? Um, I think just very quickly, just on what you said about, you know, doing medicine and knowing if it's absolutely what you want to do. Mm -hmm. A very close friend of mine at Imperial on day one of medical school, he said, um, his name's Rishi, he was like, I, I don't want to be here. And I was like, what? And he was like, I don't want to be here. I'm just here to make my parents happy. And I was like, God, that's so sad. And uh, he was like, yeah, I really want to be an architect. And six years later, he is without a doubt going to be the best doctor of any of my friends and is absolutely in love with medicine. And I think it's one of those weird things that, you know, if you're not sure about studying medicine, it might be that it actually is a really great career for you. And that if you are certain and you're one of those people, like I remember at 12 years old, I was like, I would rather, you know, be a doctor than breathe. Like it was all, absolutely all I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and it's just funny how you, you know, you, you find your way into it. And even if you're not sure what specialty you want to do, you end up doing um, something you absolutely love. Sorry, you asked what was the most, what's the most difficult. No, I mean, I think you kind of answered it. And <laughs> asked what was the, you know, what did you enjoy? What do you enjoy most about your studies? It sounds like you are absolutely passionate about medicine as a whole. Um, but is yeah, there what do I enjoy most? That you enjoy um, most. 
I think um, like at school, I, I absolutely loved sport um, and I didn't really do any individual sports. It was all team sports. And I think medicine, we've been very lucky because throughout, throughout the pandemic, we've been able to preserve a really good aspect of the job, which was the teamwork. So like I go to work every day and I'm with my team, mm -hmm. but people who work in kind of banks or in normal office jobs that have, have been made to be virtual, they've lost a lot of that team um, camaraderie and spirit. And I think you see lots of very difficult things when you're in hospital, um, but it's amazing how everyone who works in a hospital is is able to get back to um, like having normal conversations and, and laughing and that workplace environment, I think is is one of the most special things about medicine. It's a really difficult job emotionally, but then you have, you know, a consultant who's super senior might just go, hey, Ben, like, you good? You all right? And I think that's, that's really special. Um, obviously, you know, in an interview, you'd say, you know, I love the science and blah, blah, blah. But I think the teamwork aspect of medicine is, is wildly underrated and just an amazing part of the job. Yeah. What, do you, what, what, what has been the biggest challenge for you? Um, I think the, the, the time that you have to put in is really difficult. Um, it's obviously inherently a very long degree. Um, but then you have all of your friends who after three years um, they graduate and, and go off into normal jobs and and you kind of almost feel like you're a bit behind because you're you know you're, you have to be at university for another three years um, so in terms of having that drive all the time mm -hmm. to know yeah this is absolutely what I do what I want to do this is worth the worth the grind um, it's worth you know the debt that I'm accruing from being at university it is going to be worth it I think that's really difficult and there's definitely I mean I've always been absolutely certain it's what I wanted to do but I've definitely had moments where I've been like damn I should have done maths and just thought you know I could have it could have been like a much easier not that maths would have been an easier path but you know three years at uni and then done but then you know you have days where you're like this is the the best job in the world and nothing even comes close to it yeah no that's that's great thank you so much um I think we're uh, kind of getting to the time where we have to start looking at some questions from the audience. Um, but just before we start uh, with the audience, I think I'm going to start the ball rolling. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm an OC as well. I, I studied at Highgate. Um, I was very fortunate to have fantastic teachers and great help to apply to university. I was pushed by everyone, including teachers and family, to apply for medicine. Um, and I firmly uh, replied no to everyone um, also, as I had decided that, uh, it's funny, it resonated with me when Simon said that, you know, I, I wanted to fix things. And I, I had decided that I want to fix things and I didn't see medicine as the way to do that. Um, I actually saw genetics as a way to do that in my youth at the time. Um, so I thought I'm going to go study genes and then I'm going to fix children who are given just a really bad deck of cards, a birth. Um, and, and so that's why I did. But through my studies, I came to realize that actually, you know, I, I did my undergrad, then I went and did a PhD in gene therapy. And then I realized, actually, having struggled with my own health and the medical community, absolutely no offense to everyone, I think nearly everyone here, um, failed me big time. Um, and, um, you know, it was I was very much left to my own uh, accord of managing my symptoms. Um, and help. And I decided that there is a big gap in education and um, educating people about self-management, about their health, about the root of things before it even gets, you know, your, I knew all about genes, but more about, you know, what your body needs for those genes to be working as well as they can and for your body to be working well as a system. Um, and, and so I decided I want to be involved in preventative medicine, even though I'm not a doctor. Um, and, and about educating and giving people the tools to be able to take care of themselves um, and their loved ones before they get to a point where they have to come and see you guys and diagnose their diseases. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, and that's what I'm doing. So I set up a company called Screen Me uh, and, and with, with the idea of prevention and investing in the health of couples of reproductive age so that they can have healthier babies. So hopefully we can tackle um, this pandemic in a way of preventable disease. But I've noticed that there is a big issue in terms of, you know, the two sides of the NHS, the medical system, and then the preventative side and, and public health. And private companies can only do so much. 
and they can't offer services to everyone. It's, you know, so do, what do you guys think in terms, you know, don't you think that something preventative medicine wise, general public health, don't you think that should be something that's driven from top down so that everyone can have access um, to this kind of opportunity or information and uh, education? I don't know, Ali, if you want to give this a go. Sure. Well, really interesting to hear about your work. And um, yeah, really inspiring, actually, to hear about your story. So I um, am very passionate about preventative medicine. And whilst at medical school, myself and my friend Ian, who's now a foundation year one doctor, we decided that we wanted to make a difference within the medical education system because we saw a massive gap in what we were being taught around nutrition and uh, something called lifestyle medicine. So lifestyle medicine encompass, encompasses physical activity, mindfulness, nutrition, and sleep. And all these four pillars are so important to your health and well-being. Yet at medical school, you're taught very little and your doctor will very, very rarely discuss this with you, but will be more readily, um, you know, more readily able to give you out a prescription of medication rather than discussing what you can take on and be empowered with in a self-management kind of way. So myself and Ian, we set up NutriTank, which um, has evolved into a BBC award-winning organisation. It's an innovation hub for food, nutrition and lifestyle medicine. And our mission is to improve nutrition education within a uh, medical education system from undergraduate to postgraduate. So we really believe, like you said, Gornash, that preventative medicine is so important. And I hear story and story after again, um, story and story again and again, where patients say that they feel that doctors have 10 minutes, you know, your GP, and they don't feel necessarily listened to in those 10 minutes. And they've got a chronic problem, whether it's um, you know, a mental health problem such as depression or generalized anxiety disorder, or whether they're going with chronic fatigue, or whether they're going with pre-diabetes or, or whatever it is. And they feel as though um, there's just not enough time for them to understand what they can do themselves. But, um, you know, they're given brochures, they're given leaflets, and they're given the kind of, well, if we don't get this parameter to this level, then we'll have to think about giving you first line medication. So I think it's really important that there is a top down approach that um, the guidelines which show for most chronic conditions, which is um, first line to offer diet and lifestyle advice, they really should be carried out more. But unfortunately, in um, medical school, you're just not taught that. So I think that all medical students starting um, now and after the COVID-19 pandemic, where we've seen that metabolic health has been one of the greatest predictors of having a poor prognosis of COVID-19. And I think what we'll start to see is a lot more education around preventative health care and um, really just looking at whole patient-centered uh, care so um, in answer to your question, I think it's very important mm -hmm. and it's not to say it's alternative or anything like that, giving a patient, you know, exercise or nutrition or sleep advice. It's not at all. It is conventional medicine mm -hmm. and it should be done alongside, you know, um, medications and surgery and everything mm -hmm. like that. Absolutely. Ali, you and I should work together. Uh, after this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think a, a very good question um, also is, obviously, uh, as, as I mentioned before, prospective medical students have found it very difficult to access work experience. And um, so it would be good to know, Simon, uh, when you see the situation changing and what can students do um, to overcome this current uh, hurdle? So I, I am lucky enough to interview for, for medical school and every year I find it more and more embarrassing how sick formers and, and students have better CVs than me and are so much more driven than me and so much more focused and have a, such a good work ethic. The, the problem with work experience is twofold. Number one, again, a lot of it just comes from privilege, right? Who do you know? Or who do your parents know? Or who do your parents' friends know? Otherwise, there's like a 12-year waiting list and you have to, you know, sell your soul and whatever. Uh, 
And to be fair, that the whole point of work experience is around a couple of things. Number one, we want people coming into medicine to know what they're getting into. A lot of people's parents, especially non-doctors, think it's just the best thing, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I am a nice North London Jewish boy, right? And it's all like, oh, my son is a doctor. And you're like, your son is tired and works really hard and, uh, you know, whatever. Um, it, we, want, we want people coming in with their eyes open into what the job is like, the work is like, the life is like, the, the good and the bad. And also we want people who show a certain amount of commitment, a certain amount of passion and drive. And people get obsessed with work experience, meaning coming into the operating theater with me, right? Or shadowing a medical student or a doctor. And it doesn't have to be. So obviously start with the obvious ones, which are your local hospital, your local GP. But more and more, it's about just exposing yourself to healthcare. Mm -hmm. Find a local physio or an occupational therapist or a vet or a counselor or someone who works with people in the healthcare world. Because what you want is to, to see what it's like to have to have those communication skills and have those kind of things that no one really talks about. And you get a flavor for it. And you'll get a flavor for whether certain uh, specialties might fit with the kind of person you feel like you are. Um, and that's one of the advantages, for example, of, of volunteering, which is a huge thing that we, we look for at, at interviews. Because if you volunteer and your job is every weekend to go to your local old people's home and hang out with them and play cards and make them cups of tea, you might think that that doesn't mean anything, but actually it's a lot of what we do as a doctor. Mm -hmm. It's about listening and working with other people and you'll meet the GP and you'll meet the district nurse and you'll meet all these other people who are involved in their lives who you never really hear about. And, and one of the, the big things when I was, you know, when we were preparing for this talk is, is this idea that people think they have to be a certain personality type to, to get into medicine or to be a doctor. Like all, I mean, I'm, I'm a cliche because I'm a, you know, white rugby boy and I became an orthopedic surgeon, but um, actually what we're finding more and more is there is no personality type that fits with medicine. It's about being driven and wanting to do it. And those old stories of like, you had to be this person to be a surgeon or this person to be a GP. You know, one of my, um, one of my friends who's a GP, uh, one day a week, he does the rapid response car hem stuff. So, you know, four days a week, he sits in his surgery wearing, you know, corduroys and listening to people chat to him about their pets. And then one day a week, he's in a car doing 150 miles an hour, cracking people's chest by the roadside. But uh, 10 years ago, everyone was like, GP means this. And, and more and more, uh, actually, work experience allows you to realize that medicine is or isn't for you. And that's what's important, not whether you fit in with this club or that club. It's about being able to reflect on what you've learned and what you've seen. And that's what we ask you about at interviews. We don't say, please give me vomit at me the three things you saw on the one day you did work experience. We're going to say, what did you learn? What was the most powerful thing you saw? What was what was the you know, what what are the pros and cons of healthcare from your experience on work experience? And, and so that whole reflective piece is huge as well. Yeah, thank you so much. That's that's really good insight. So I think, you know, some people have been asking what's the best piece of advice, etc. And I think after that explanation uh, from Simon, I think getting some work experience will really help. Um, help you understand uh, if this is something you really want to do will help, help clarify a lot for you um i'm just gonna you know we don't have much time but i'm gonna look at some questions that have been asked in the q a um just just so we can answer some of them um so someone has said that if you could give one piece of advice to a year 12 who's just beginning uh, to be interested in medicine what would it be i think uh, maybe ben if you if you give this a go um i think i i guess echoing what Simon was saying, knowing what you're getting into. Um, I think for a lot of people who have parents who are doctors, they might have maybe a better perception or have family members who, who are doctors. Um, but like my parents are journalists and at the point at even which I was 
stepping into my third year like hospital work I'm not sure I really actually understood what the job entailed um like I couldn't have told you at 17 Ben Reed could not have told you what Dr Reed at 25 would be doing in in a morning like I actually didn't know what what junior doctors did or even really what senior doctors did um and I think that is really important it's great you know if you can get some work experience working at a uh you know a cardiothoracic surgery center or a neurosurgery center that's great you'll see some guy operating you'll see it, it'll be amazing but actually knowing what the job is like and for the vast majority of your of your junior doctoring life and for your training until you until you know get to Simon's level and get to consultant level it's it's really not that sexy style of medicine that we see on like tv and stuff um and i think being prepared for that um and not thinking that on day one you're going to roll up and you're going to be like the guy from house like just you know throwing out diagnoses it doesn't work like that you're you know filling out paperwork and requesting x-rays for the first three years of your life as a doctor um and i think that's really important getting a work experience with a consultant is great but actually getting work experience with a junior doctor and knowing what you're going to be doing as soon as you graduate from medical school and what medical school would actually be like if I was interviewing someone and they had that versus you know spend the day with a consultant I think I'd take the person who's got a more realistic expectation of what their life is going to be like for the first you know five years. That's great thank you Ben um, and we have a question here asking about whether it would be better if a candidate for medicine uh, was fortunate enough to volunteer, for example, with vulnerable people abroad in a less economically developed country compared to perhaps uh, an opportunity in their, uh, you know, in the UK. Um, is would do you think that that would give them an extra um, point in their application? Um, I don't know, Simon. Maybe this is uh, one that you could. Again, it's it swings and roundabouts. Uh, if you if you go out and you do Medicine Frontier or you go out to Gaza or you go out to the developing world or whatever, and, and you put that on your statement and I ask you about it and you go, yeah, I was super cool. Yeah. Like that, I can't, like, I can't help you. Whereas if you say I went to the building, it's four doors down from where I live uh, and I helped, um, uh, children with learning difficulties and I learned all about the humility of being a parent with a child with learning difficulties and then and then and, and, and so again it's only cool if you learn something otherwise it's just you, you know it's really interesting right Ali was really reflective about her gap year and you get people who are really reflective about their gap year and they say I grew as a person and this is why and this is how and then you get the people who are like yeah I went to Thailand yeah I was awesome and and they are two very different experiences and I think if you can go somewhere like that and it doesn't feel like that kind of slightly cringeworthy um, uh, kind of nearly tourism. I went out there for a whole week and I, 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 I made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Sure, you, you helped Africa for five days versus um, I went out there and this is what I learned. Then that's great. Um, the ability to do that thing doesn't necessarily make it a good thing. It's what you take away from it and what you what kind of doctor and person it's going to make you that's going to impress the people on the other side of the table fantastic and i think we, we were all like ridiculously lucky i still think back now how insanely lucky and and the statistics of me being able to go to highgate was so minimal and to have two parents that loved me very much and there are people who need help everywhere and i i think you know it's very easy to find places that you know in london you know as close as North London and probably down the road from from where you live or the, the route that you walk home from school, you know, going to going to Thailand and helping people and, you know, going on a gap yard and, you know, being this sort of white knight, this white savior that turns up and, and helps people. There's people in your area that, you know, like Simon said, the little old ladies down at the community Absolutely. center who you know would, would love to speak to a young person. Absolutely. Uh, that's definitely, definitely true. It's amazing what you will find if you start looking, um, uh, which is very important. Um, Ali, just a quick question. Would you say that you still have time to enjoy the things, you know, your hobbies, things that you like doing, or as someone has asked, or is it as bad as the book, this is going to hurt? Oh, Adam Kay. Um, he's fantastic, by the way, a very funny guy. Um, 
I did go and see him. I took my mum. Um, but it's not like that anymore. And, you know, he had a really senior role. You have to think that he was just one tier away from being a consultant, which is, you know, the top of the medical ranking. And he was in charge um, that night that he spoke about that really unfortunate incident that made him reflect on why he wanted to leave medicine, where he lost two patients. So, you know, that is for me so many years away from me even being his level. And then to just bring it back to what actual medical school is like, um, because I haven't entered, obviously, I start in August, so I, I, that's when I enter the workforce. Um, medical school has been an incredible experience. Um, for me, it's been seven years since I've left Highgate. So I've actually, I'm about, and I'm about to graduate as a doctor. So it's been the same length of time as secondary school, um, which is a really strange thought. And so I quite like that in the first place that you really get a much longer student period than most other um, degrees, because it just allows you to just grow into yourself before you start work. It's quite a fortunate position, but obviously if you flip it on, it, on its head, like what Ben said, you do, um, everything's more delayed you know you get married later you have kids later you earn money later you move out from your parents later all that kind of thing um but I would say that in those seven years I've definitely managed to do everything that I've loved and so please don't fret that um you won't be able to pursue other things if you just go on Instagram today you'll see a million junior doctors that are junior doctors who DJ, junior doctors who cook, junior doctors who race car. Medics have other lives outside of it all. Um, so let's not forget that. But one thing I would say, um, it is a lifestyle choice. And so when I do advise people that I mentor, I do say that is the hardest thing for me about medical school. It's not the knowledge that I'm trying to jam into my head for exams. You can redo exams. It's, you know, it's not the end of the world. You don't want to fail too many times, but you can redo them. What's hard is the lifestyle and fitting you, your mental health, your friends, your family, all around that really busy schedule. And um, if you do go outside of London, you are on placement in places in the country you've never been before and um that is difficult and you have to think how you can find hobbies there um that aren't necessarily in bristol i know that some of my close guy friends who are part of sports teams and things like that in their preclinical years when they went into clinical it was it was tricky to keep up with that because you're three hours away from bristol in a random rural hospital so it all is possible it's just the thing is about medical school is just being the most organized human being so that you don't have to fret about having you time and cancelling on that may and not being able to use the pub because you can you just have to plan um but yeah there are definitely hard times where you are head in books and you're like oh my gosh all my friends are out partying and blah 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 but you know Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So basically, you can enjoy your hobbies and other things as long as you're organized, um, organized enough to do it, um, which is great, great advice. And even if you don't do it in medicine, um, it, this, this applies uh, for your studies and when you start your career, uh, it's important to schedule things in uh, to maintain your mental health. And on that note of um, emotional highs and lows, um, ben, would can you just tell us a bit about the the kind of the challenge of this emotional highs and lows of working with children, especially? Yeah, so um, I have always uh, wanted to work in um, rehabilitation for children. My uh, original reason I got interested uh, in medicine is I wanted to do prosthetics. Um, and when I when I graduate um, in May, I start at the Royal National Orthopaedic uh, in pediatric reconstruction. Um, and still, even though that's the job I want to do, still by far the most emotionally difficult rotation I've had was pediatrics. Mm -hmm. And I think the most the tricky things are when you see aspects of people you know in patients that you see or interact with. Uh, I think doctors are really good at, um, you know, 
being very professional about keeping their emotions and their and their decisions separate. Um, but when you have like a kid in front of you who reminds you of someone that you used to know, or um, a teenager who actually is not that much different from you in an emotional intelligence sense, um, that's really tricky. Um, and now with with um, COVID. You, it used to be that lots of families could come into the hospital and see their loved ones. Uh, and now having had um, medical school shut down twice and being asked to go and work in, in COVID situations, I think seeing people not able to see their family and, and seeing how um, some patients in previous times, they would have had a, a loved one like fighting for them and saying, you know, doctor, I really think we should, you know, try and do this or um, oh, my my mum's very uncomfortable. Could someone come and like change her bed sheets? Um, I think seeing people now deeply alone in hospitals is really, really tricky. And often feeling like your job or your role, you can't do everything you can to make them comfortable. I think that's really, really hard. Um, feeling uh, not inadequate, but yeah, I suppose inadequate is the word. Like you can't give someone, you know, all the care that you would want to. Um, I think that's really tricky and kids especially you know there are some uh, grown-ups who because of the way that they've run their life they've ended up quite unwell you know they've not taken care of themselves they've drunk too much smoked a little bit too much haven't been out and done any exercise um, but kids are just always absolutely the victim um, and I remember being as a, a very young person watching the news and now I still watch the news when I see videos from war zones I'm able to rationalize that that's very difficult for adults but seeing kids in that situation just completely breaks my heart. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, that that's a really difficult uh, aspect of the job. Um, mm. But don't let don't let that put you off, because when you sometimes get a good situation where something's really awful and someone says thank you to you and you're like, ah, well, it's all worth it then. Yeah, yeah no, that's gosh. Yeah, that is difficult. Um, and it's actually admirable that, um, you know, medical professionals, um, go kind of, you know, take that on uh, head first and, and don't give up. Uh, and that's admirable in itself. I think um, I, I, I said that was the last question, but just just to bring this to an end, I think on, on that note, Simon, do you think this is something that uh, is, is a major consideration when it comes to training, um, this kind of aspect of the emotional struggles and the highs and lows? Yeah, uh, is the short answer. So um, I've spent, I mean, certainly in the last year, one of my major roles has been advocating around uh, well-being for in particular junior doctors and, and medical students because they are some of the hardest hit within the profession in terms of the uncertainty but also in terms of there are these uh, without getting into the nitty-gritty of it there's there's a lot of shame and a lot of guilt and a lot of perfectionism in healthcare uh, we hold ourselves to unobtainable standards and then we feel absolutely terrible when we either can't or don't meet those standards. Mm -hmm. And when you wrap that all up in fatigue and all the other stuff, um, there is a lot of burnout in healthcare. There is a lot of mental illness and mental health problems in healthcare. It is a fact of the job. And it is only in the last couple of years that through the work of certain organizations and individuals, the powers that be have recognized that it's a thing. So if you look at other high stress, high emotional, uh, demand jobs like say people in the military they get it from day one they get told when they should check in with people about their mental health and how they should check in and what it is you know it was great to hear Ali talk about it you know what mindfulness is and wellness is and it's not mandatory yoga it's about being able to take care of yourself and bring yourself a little bit of joy and take a break and make sure that you take all your annual leave, even if someone is like, yeah, but we really need you. And you're like, yeah, well, I really need a day off. Mm -hmm. um, and COVID has actually highlighted this idea that I've always talked about, which is um, doctors always used to set themselves on fire to keep other people warm. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think slowly healthcare is moving away from that. And medical school is probably where we need to start teaching it and role modeling it that idea that it's okay to be like, you know what? I'm not okay and I need to speak to someone. Or you know what? This is too much and I need to just take a breather. Or it's the holidays and I'm going to actually have a holiday. 
not do a project for someone who dumped it in my lap the last minute or whatever. So absolutely, I think it's probably going to be one of the biggest growth areas in medical education. Certainly, I'm I'm doing loads of work and I know loads of other people are. That idea that it it that self-care is healthcare is something that's really starting to resonate with with the powers that be. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Simon. This has been so, so inspiring. Um, you know, so ultimately, um, you know, you can't fill anyone else's cup if your cup is empty. And uh, and so it, it's not actually a selfish thing to do. As a matter of fact, it's the selfless thing to do is, is you need you need to look after yourself to be able to help others. Uh, and I think going into medical school with that in mind is is maybe you know number one on the list. Um, so thank you all. Uh, you, you always know if a talk has been good when it goes over time. Um, and, and this has certainly gone over time. Um, so, so I hope everyone has found it useful. I'm gonna hand over to Stuart now, uh, someone who I've known for a very long time and admire a lot. So Stuart, all over to you. That's really kind, Rosh, undeserved, I think. But um, well, thanks, Gorn, Michelle, and thank you everyone for making this event possible. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, to our fantastic um, panelists and to our fantastic moderator, um, being here tonight is actually above and beyond in itself, um, especially given what you're dealing with um, at present um, and lots of other people are dealing with also. Um, but to speak so passionately and to offer such insight and advice um, and, and for people to take away um, and to learn about and think about as well um, and be inspired by, um, I think is fantastic. Um, and we're so very, very grateful as well that you, that you could be here, um, all of you. Um, to some other thanks uh, for me as ever, to Claire and Jasmine in, our, in the development office, uh, the alumni office for their enormous help also setting this up. Um, it's been a truly inspirational evening and um, hopefully we'll see some of you um, at our next uh, Old Chomleyans talks our next webinars um, after half term um, but that's it from me um, enjoy the rest of the evening um, thank you everybody again um, truly inspirational thank you bye-bye